Hello everybody and welcome back once again to yet another addition to my journey through One Piece. Uh, today we're going to be talking about such an amazing, really fun, uh, excellent arc, Impel Down. I mean, I'm recording this portion separate from the discussion portion, uh, just for the AJP's comments, because I had to record the discussion stuff earlier. I talked about so many things, I had so much fun talking about it, and this is probably one of my favorite videos, if not my favorite video I've ever made about One Piece, just talking about the the theories and things I got in my mind and the great things that Impel Down does and all sorts of things. Characters, character arcs, different sort of themes being tackled. Lots of stuff, so I enjoyed making this a ton, hopefully you guys enjoy it. But before getting into that discussion, once again, just to let you know, uh, if you want early access for the next arc, and the next one is a big one, Marineford, uh, you can do so by getting early access through Patreon, but I'll remind you again at the end. So without further ado, let's get into this week's, or this video's, AJP's comments. Thank you again for sending them in, as always. So this one is from Talking Taco, who says, Hey man, I love the One Piece videos. I've known that you say that you didn't want to make One Piece videos due to copyright, those being polished analysis, edited videos, uh, with footage and all that, uh, similar to my main channel videos, but is there any arc or particular character that you wish you could make a video about? Uh, yeah, yeah, if I was interested in making videos, which I'm not, just to clear that up, uh, again, I still don't want to make any One Piece videos, and if I did, I would burn myself out on the series, it's not happening, but if I did, there are a few things that I would want to talk about. Usopp is an obvious one, I could easily talk for a long time about Usopp, um, I think Vivi would be another one, Vivi, I, you guys know how much I adore her, and, uh, honestly, characters that I feel are lesser appreciated, or not really, in my experience, not really... Yeah, I guess lesser appreciated is the best way to put it. Characters like Moria, uh, characters like Spandom. Spandom is prime material for a sort of video that I would tend to make over characters that I feel maybe misunderstood or kind of dismissed a little bit, things like that. So those are four potential candidates uh, for a video. But again, I'm not making any. This is plenty. The next one is from Nico. Usopp standing between Sanji and the unstoppable force Kuma is another example of why I love their, in my opinion, understated relationship. From all the way back in the Alabasta Saga, when Sanji defeats Mr. Two and takes Usopp's goggles back from him, they have all these small moments that makes their dynamic awesome. Sanji kicking Usopp away from Enel's attack and taking the blast himself, Sanji kicking Luffy to stop him from saying something he knows that would be incredibly painful for Usopp to hear, and then inspiring Usopp or Soga King, who is wearing the goggles Sanji won back for him, uh, that he has a role to fill that Sanji or any anyone else in the crew wouldn't be able to do. This is then carried on in Thriller Bark when Usopp is the only one able to face the opponent even Sanji and Zoro were being halted by. But in this instance with Kuma, neither Sanji, Usopp, or anyone else could do anything to stop him. And while recognizing this, Usopp, without hesitation, tries putting his life and everything he has on the line. Maybe he was hoping he could at least buy time, because an injured Sanji would definitely disappear and in his mind probably die, if he didn't do something. As futile as it was, I think the spirit of the back and forth he and Sanji have is still there in this scene. I love that you pointed this out because... I totally agree. I think if we're talking underlying character arcs or character uh, developments or progressions, one of the ones I've been a huge fan of uh, that's been subtle and underlying is Nami. Her progression through particularly Jaya into Skypiea and on from there has been underlying but really awesome, and I love a slow burn of a dynamic or a character progression. Another one I find really cool, though this isn't really underlying, but uh, Frankie and Robin. It isn't really underlying, but it's more, it's less in the forefront than, uh, you know, uh, Luffy Nami, or Luffy Zoro, or Zoro Sanji, stuff like that. But along those lines, Sanji Usopp is a great one. Uh, I particularly remember talking quite a bit about how, how much Sanji helped inspire him, and helped empower him, and believe in himself again. And I didn't really think about it, but in this moment, yeah, I think those elements are very much here. So thank you for bringing those to light, and I think it really helps heighten my appreciation for both characters, and that moment, which... I got choked up talking about it in that video, so I'm sure you guys can tell how much it meant to me, and this really heightens that, so thank you. Kevin Boyd has uh, this one, which brings up a really interesting point about uh, how the archipelago, the Sabaudi archipelago, is environmentally used for indirect storytelling in a couple of ways. And a great way to describe this is that the only way to get into the New World is the impossible hike at the Red Line, uh, or the, uh, the really wealthy aristocratic uh, 
avenue through Marajoa, which which was explained to us by uh, Popog. But there's an alternate way, which is through Fishman Island, coating your coating your boat in resin, all the stuff that they were trying to do. And so, in order to get there, you have to sort of dredge through the muck in order to in order to make your way to the new world uh, it's much harder it's much there are much more obstacles which is a great uh, sort of symbolic way of showing the class dif difference the hierarchy and another great point is that something that distinguishes Sabaudi the end of Sabaudi is that throughout a lot of Luffy's fights he hasn't really had to think about his friends losing their battles. He has, he's he been solely focused on himself a lot of the time. Not to say it never happened, because I don't know. I, I My memory isn't equipped with the uh, exact information to say whether or not that's true for throughout the whole story. But a lot of the time, he's focused on himself, beating the enemy in front of him to save everyone else. Not really if they can uh, withstand the enemy in front of them. So this is a big distinction, and I think it really adds to the, to the element of futility here. Luffy cannot help with a lot of this, and that is part of what kills him. But uh, thank you very much for the comment, Kevin. Sorry for paraphrasing. Uh, just for the nature of time, I have to paraphrase a little bit. But thank you so much for your comment and uh, for being a patron as well. Next is from Sarah Brewer, who uh, notes some similarities between this arc and Arlong Park. I love how this arc adds so many layers and nuance to Arlong Park and the Fishmen. How we can see that the rhetoric Arlong spews is, ver is the very insults that are flung at Fishmen. Very true. Also like he's trying to reclaim those slurs. How Arlong Park looks exactly like Sabaudi, trying to create a, f a space for Fishmen like Sabaudi Park so that they don't have to be excluded. Arlong goes from a despicable villain to an incredibly human character desperate to make things better for his people, blinded by the hatred he holds for humanity. I love that. I love that. If I ever want to reread Arlong Park, it's gonna hit like mad, knowing the basis behind all these emotions and his motives. Obviously, this doesn't absolve Arlong of the th horrible things he's done. Obviously not, I'm not saying that, but it adds tons of sympathy for the reason for why he does it in the first place. Am I sympathetic towards him? Absolutely. Do I still deride his actions? Absolutely. Those two can work in tandem. And so, Arlong Park, I think, is elevated quite a bit through Sabaudi Archipelago and the things we get through there. And I love that. I love how the story can uh, bend back on itself and substantiate uh, earlier arcs with new information that's clearly been planned by Oda with foresight. Because... There, there are some elements that you can kind of argue like, okay, maybe he thought of those along the way and they just kind of fit in. But the way in which Arlong Park is tackled, if you'll recall, when I when I read that arc, I distinctly remember saying that there's more to Arlong. Like there is, there seems to be a gap there, and this is it. This is this is a lot of it. So uh, Oda intentionally, I think, wrote this sort of blank space to be filled in with context from the Fishman Island situation. And I adore that. Thank you for your comments, Sarah. Last couple, Drip Soup says, I don't know if you've already been told this, but back in Orange Town when Buggy's first introduced, in the small flashback of Shanks and Buggy being part of the same crew, you actually get the first look at Rayleigh with his signature beard. I also heard that Oda made sure the anime didn't refer to him as the captain. It's that kind of foreshadowing that makes One Piece so good on reread. Love that. Love that. Don't have much to say about it, but these little glimpses of characters we see that end up being relevant hundreds of chapters later, I adore that. Garp as well in the cover stories, the infamous R.I.P. Garp. Um, we're seeing Rayleigh there, that's awesome. I love it. And the last one is from Camors. Uh, I had to stop to write this comment when I heard the other AJP's comment about how Zoro joined the crew when he fights Mihawk and Usopp when he apologizes. I've heard this before, but it's not exactly when they join the crew. It's when they f become fully accepting of Luffy as their captain. Before Zoro fights Mihawk, he was still in the mindset, if Luffy gets in my way, that I will, then I will kill him. After this, he became the character that would say nothing happened. For Usopp, you can notice that he will never ever joke uh, about him being the captain of the crew again. Now, Luffy is undoubtedly the captain. They are already part of the crew in the sense of friendship, dynamics, and love, but this loyalty and respect with Luffy, with Luffy specifically, not with the crew as a whole, starts after these moments. Uh, I think I can get behind that. I, th I, I would have to reflect and think on it a bit more. But to me, I still very much disagree that these characters only become parts of the crew at those specific moments. Um, some people in the comments mentioned that there's a naming scheme for when characters formally become part of the crew. And I get that, but I think, but my personal opinion is that it's much more apt to say that those titles refer to when they formally uh, accepted Luffy as captain. I think that makes a bit more sense, because 400 chapters of Usopp 
uh, and the dynamics and the friendship and contributing to the crew and helping the crew and fixing things and defending and protecting his friends. You cannot tell me that he was not part of the crew. To me, he very much was. Um, so yeah, I think I like this, this interpretation better. I think that fits a lot better for all of them as well. Not just Usopp. Anyways, thank you very much for your One Piece comments. Those are all the ones for this video. And if you'd like to send in some ones in the future to be read out loud, just be sure to use the hashtag AJPiece and it'll be potentially entered and read aloud on a future video. Hey, sorry for the cut. Uh, just had to record the AJP segment separate from this segment just for time management reasons. Um, but starting with Impel Down, this arc was so much fun and yet so dense with little details that I think you could really miss the richness of if you were just kind of along for the ride. And, you know, that's totally fine if you're just along for the ride because there's plenty of entertainment value here through the interactions and the, you know, the rollicking fun, the action, the fights, the bombast, everything. If you don't really care about those details, then this arc is still going to be awesome for you. But if you do, then there is... Uh, plenty here to reward you. And a lot of the thematics here that I really take away from this arc come from discussion, uh, internal reflection, and just, uh, you know, thinking about the things that Oda provides to us uh, a little bit more. Impel Down is really interesting in that I assumed going into it that it would be quite uh, heavy, very weighty, um, because, you know, we're going to save Luffy's brother, we're going to save Ace, and he's on death row. I assumed that this would be huge and weighty and very emotional and heavy from the start, but it really wasn't. It's kind of the anti sabauti in a way. The interaction between those two arcs in tandem is really interesting because sabauti you know, uh, bright light circus, uh, it looks wondrous from the outside and you go in and there's all this corruption and the arc is desperately dark. But with this arc, it is this horrible prison and we go in and we're supposed to save uh, Luffy's brother, but it's just tons of fun. And of course there are lots of heavy concepts, but start to finish, I would describe this arc as very fun. Now we'll get into those concepts and deeper things later on. That's not to say, of course, as you guys know, that there aren't lots of deeper things to talk about, like I've already said. But it just kind of, it really interested me that this arc's tone was so... Uh, you know, rollicking. But in terms of themes that I've alluded to, there is that one that I've talked about in the last video, which is Impel Down, just in general, is shut off from the world. There is immense corruption, torture, unlawful imprisonment, and it all happens below the surface in the calm belt. The world turns a blind eye because, you know, there's consequences for not turning a blind eye to what the world government does. And just symbolically, I love that it's in the calm belt because the water is calm. But beneath the surface is the corruption and the terror. And Impel Down in general, uh, it's been described in my chat as a uh, metaphorical kind of allusion to Dante's Inferno, uh, the abyss, hell, as you go further and further down these depths of depravity. It's really interesting how Oda used his creativity here, not in terms of the islands, because I talked before about how Oda's creativity was great for giving us all sorts of islands that um, come to the fore through his, like, the concept of this island in the sky, or the Sabaudi Archipelago, or Long Ring Long Land, or Little Garden. You know, all these imaginative islands. I've talked about how Oda's creativity is his only ceiling, and if he has boundless creativity, there's no ceiling. He is able to use his creativity to, what sort of environments can I put together with regards to something much darker, to torture? So it's interesting to see that complexion here. Uh, but yeah, these depths of depravity, this corruption, this torture, these terrors beneath the surface, very societal, very political, kind of speaks to the nature of the world in One Piece. But another main theme, maybe the main theme I see here, is that of connections. Luffy comes here alone. Actually, he doesn't come here alone. Forgive me. He comes here with Boa. The reason he's able to come here at all is because Boa hooks him up with a ship because he's made a connection with Boa through his kindness and through how how much she cares for him and seems to be in love with him. But regardless, they have this relationship that's very this connection that's very um, sweet. And so this arc starts with connections in that way and it ends with it. Luffy comes here, Boa takes him in, he is on his own after that point, and he just wants to get to the lower layers to rescue Ace. The reason he's here is for his connection to Ace. Along the way, he sees these people that he's seen in the past. Mr. Three, Mr. Tubong Clay, Buggy, uh, Crocodile, Jinbei, who he strikes up a new partnership with, Mr. One, Eva, all these people, whether they're new friends or old enemies, it doesn't matter. 
Luffy has some sort of connection with them. And because they're in this place where their common goal is to get the hell out of here. Uh, you know, there are some there's some motivations along the way as Luffy goes deeper and Buggy and Mr. Three don't want to go deeper. Um, they kind of diverge there, obviously. But in the end, they all want the same thing, which is to get the hell out. And so these connections that Luffy forms or has had, whether they're positive or negative, they're there. And they help strengthen Luffy on his way down and on his way out whether they be friendship or whether they be enemies with mutually beneficial uh, motives, with goals, that, with common goals, it doesn't matter. Connections from start to finish are a huge theme of this arc. They push Luffy forward. He wouldn't be able to get anywhere without them. The reason he's here is because of his connection. And in, at the end of the day, Jinbei and his connection to these whale sharks is what allows them to escape. Friendship friendship in that case. So uh, connection's a huge theme here. It's a, a huge thing with this arc is how Luffy puts together this ragtag crew, this new comma, these new, th these people who were never a part of his crew before. Uh, they, a lot of them were enemies, like I said, but they joined together nonetheless. Part of it is, like I said, these common goals, but part of it is also Luffy's just unique charisma and the driving force that he is. And when that works in tandem with the connections he has, he is unstoppable. And I would be amiss, uh, this isn't really a theme as much as a character thing, but to me, I was amazed at one character in particular, and that is Buggy. Buggy the Clown. People would come into my chat earlier in Orange Town or the earlier arcs whenever he was there and go, Buggy D. Goat, and he's the best, and I love him, and I'm like, okay, like, he's a fine character. I don't, I guess he's just a meme for reasons I'm not aware of because uh, maybe there's some sort of joke that I don't know because I'm a newcomer to One Piece and I don't partake in the discourse or the uh, fan culture or whatever. I just kind of brush it off as like, Buggy's a meme for some reason. But no, like, he becomes a genuinely very interesting, good, solid character that comments on a lot of things and whose arc is so interesting. And it just so happens that this is where it happens. Impel down. Halfway through the series, I guess. I, I guess that people in chat were imparting their current knowledge of the character onto his past appearances, which is why I was confused. Nonetheless, I digress. Buggy's growth here is immense, so interesting. It is the thing I take away from this the most, honestly. There's amazing stuff with Jinbei, who we'll talk about. Jinbei's an awesome new character. Um, love some stuff with Ace, some details about Whitebeard, Croc, seeing Croc, uh, Mr. Two, a star of the show, absolutely. Some interesting themes throughout, and Luffy, of course. Luffy's a star. But the one, I can't help it, the one thing I take away from this arc the most is buggy. He's funny. His interactions with Luffy are hilarious. He's uh, all over the place. He's he's an awful person, but at the same time, he's so likable. And his conversations are so fun. He's so self-serving, but cowardly at times. And yet he's kind of tough because he's experienced torture and lived to tell the tale and is, seems to be hardened by it. He has this unique sort of charisma that bands people together. He gets misunderstood, and yet it feels genuine at the same time. And he just stumbles his way upwards into becoming this crazy-ass revolutionist. And he earns this immense belief in himself by the end, because is some of that false? I guess. But at the same time, he ends up being one of the spearheads of a historic jailbreak. He stumbled into it, but I don't mean to say that he didn't do that through his own merits, because he did. At the end of the arc, him and Luffy are said to be the two spearheads, the two notable uh, names associated with this, and I think that's fair. And he is now the savior for a bunch of these people who, who broke out. So I'm so interested to see where his journey is going to go. He wants to become a, uh, an emperor. He wants to become the Pirate King. He now believes it could happen. Will it happen? Where will Zark go? I don't know, but I think it could comment on a lot of interesting themes uh, about leadership. I think it could really integrate with the ideas about leadership, the themes about leadership, and kind of the farce that it can be, and what it means to be a true leader, and all that sort of thing. We'll see how it goes, but... I, I don't know exactly where it's going to go just yet. Those are the ideas I have swimming in my mind thematically, but all I know is that he's so engaging. Uh, he, I mean, we'll see where he is in my rankings at the end, but he's awesome. But like I said, Jinbei's great. He might be my second favorite outside of Luffy uh, character in this arc. He, there's this undercurrent of miracles, this theme of miracles. He brings it up a couple of times throughout. He says, I want to stop this war, and he says that... Uh, believing in miracles. There is merit to it. They do exist. They do happen. And if you integrate that with the fact that Luffy as a character has been the subject of some cosmic luck, as, we, as we've talked about before, this fortune that he seems to have, he very much seems to be cut from the same cloth 
uh, ideologically in a couple of ways from Luffy. He very much fits in uh, as an ally of Luffy, and so it makes no, it's not surprising at all that they teamed up in the way they did. Uh, and he's got this connection to Arlong, to the Fishman Island stuff. I think Jinbei could easily play a very significant role going forward, and I hope he does, because I think he's great. And I'll dive into those stuff more later on, these character details, but I just wanted to give a summary of that, of the sort of things I'm going to talk about later on. That's the long and short of it for both those two. It was great seeing Croc again, Sir Crocodile. It was awesome seeing Mr. Tubon Clay. He is a hero this arc um and uh, mr three had some cool moments uh like i said eva's a great new character really fun it was cool seeing mr one inazuma etc all the character uh stuff was really fun and really meaningful as well at points but yeah the idea of miracles just getting back to my point uh what jinbei says how it connects to luffy and the instances throughout the story uh some of these coincidences we've seen we, we've seen some in alabasta logtown skypia these things that would seem to be miracles, yet they always seem to fall into Luffy's lap, maybe because he is the type who dares to believe in them, to believe in these dreams, dreams, miracles. Uh, Jinbei is really interesting in that way and bringing that forth, and Eva says something very essential, that miracles are very much worth uh, taking stock in. Stopping this war seems like a miracle, yet Jinbei wants to do it. Eva seems to be this miracle worker, as described, described by Mr. Tubon Clay. It's a consistent undercurrent. And one more character thing that I forgot to dwell on is uh, Modulin, a, a newcomer to this to this arc. Don't have a ton to say about him, I won't say a ton about him throughout, but I think he generally kind of surprised me actually, because he's established as this character who is on the toilet like something like 16 hours a day because he has constant diarrhea. And when you do that, when you make kind of the primary antagonist of this arc, um, this very monumental arc, this comical concept of a character, it might be a little bit hard to back up and make him seem fearsome, which he had to be. But the way that the thing that really nails it, in spite of this comical foundation for the character, this diarrhea stuff, is the presentation. His Hydra power is fearsome. This poison dragon, uh, the the spreads, the illustrations of this are incredibly overpowering and and scary in universe. And the way he's portrayed, you know, low angles, looking up at him, very big. He towers over people, uh, very authoritative, dark colors, shading, the expressions. Lots of great little presentation details that Oda uses that Oda uses very effectively to make him fearsome, to make him this monumental foe, not just in terms of power, but in terms of presentation. So I just wanted to draw attention to Modulin in that way because he was effective, even if I don't have a ton to say about him. And so now we get into some theories I have. Uh, just to very quickly sum it up, I could ramble for forever about my thoughts. The long and short of this is, this is a... This is an arc to save Ace from death. He is to be executed very soon. Um, at the beginning of this arc, at the end of this arc, no matter the progress they made in different ways, he is on his way to Marineford, and he is to be executed in like three hours. So there is a very real possibility of Ace dying here. Now, as for my take on what will happen, I think there will be a death. Will it be Ace's? We'll see. But the thing that really, that I think about is a couple of times now, Ace's death has been talked about by other parties, uh, like, in a few hours, he's going to be executed. And then someone else talked about it earlier on. I don't remember exactly the context, but we see then the two executioners with swords crossing his neck in an X shape. That is very reminiscent of Roger. And so that just made me think, that imagery, that made me think, could Ace... It all seems to be set up for Ace to be saved. There seems to be so much inevitability about Ace's death that, it, that I feel like... I feel like Oda is trying to make us feel like he will be saved. But what if he isn't? What if there's a tragic inevitability to this? What if this is indicative of the dark turn that One Piece is making as a story? I've always said, I think that One Piece will ultimately, when all is said and done, when it's when the story is finished, will conclude on these very same optimistic themes. Freedom, uh, the connections, protecting your dreams, following your dreams, these beautiful little detours, the adventure that is life, the soul and spirit of a pirate as Luffy embodies it. All that stuff. But that doesn't mean that it's going to stay as tonally light as it always was. I think it may take a dark turn, and I think a death could propel it into that tone. Because what if after all this, there is just an inevitability to it, and the narrative makes it feel like any minute now, Ace is going to be saved, Luffy's going to come up and save him like he saved all his friends before. He's going to save his brother here, but then... It just carries on, and Ace ends up dying. 
in Marine Ford. And this is where the imagery of his potential execution and why it looks so similar to Roger could come to play. What if there are two deaths that shape Luffy's legacy as a person? The death of Goldie Roger, which spurred on the pirate age and Luffy is the embodiment of that spirit, and he's carrying the torch. And what if his brother dies? in a very similar way. Those two people, as we now know, to skip ahead, I've read, uh, this, this video will cover chap up to chapter 550. Those people that we now know are father and son. What if a father and a son's death shape Luffy's legacy and journey and who he becomes as the Pirate King as a leader? What if Ace's death is something that really makes him rethink the type of journey he's on and the type of danger those close to him get put in? Because as we know, um, Ace's, Ace being captured, as Blackbeard explains, is associated with Luffy, him chasing after Luffy. So what if this would make Luffy completely rethink the way he approaches life? Or maybe not completely rethink it, but just go it out from a different angle. Maybe a different sort of recklessness. A different sort of approach. What if he has to grow from this in some way? And the two main things that shape him as a person is Roger imbues him with the spirit. Not to say that he never had that spirit, of course. I think he always had it. But Roger really was the stimulant to set him off. Uh, he inspired Shanks as well, who inspired Luffy. Just in general, Roger, Roger's death was a, a life-altering moment for Luffy. Even if it happened before he was dead. You know what I mean. And then what if Ace dying is the second pivotal event that shapes the type of king or person he wants to be. The type of conquest he leads and makes him rethink... I want to be able to save everyone, and I wasn't able to do it here, and I paid the ultimate price, well, my brother paid the ultimate price, and so I have to change things. I could easily see Oda going that direction in the story, I think it's very plausible. However, I also think it's plausible that Ace doesn't die, and instead someone very close to him does. I think it's possible that Whitebeard dies, and the reason for that is there is a line throughout the story, uh, somewhere in Impel Down, where someone says that Whitebeard dying would cause all hell to break loose completely. Whitebeard's coming to save Ace, there's gonna be a war between the warlords and the world government and Whitebeard's pirates, but someone says that. That Whitebeard dying could cause all hell to break loose. I, again, I wish I'd remembered who said it, but I don't, sorry about that. But Oda wouldn't just write that in for no reason. There is a reason behind that. That's very deliberate. And we have Croc saying that he wants to go after Whitebeard and kill him. We have Buggy saying that because he wants to become an emperor. And do I necessarily think either of those two are going to kill Whitebeard? No, not really. But the concept of Whitebeard dying has come up again and again. He is a sought-after head. And if his death could set off a war, if, if it could cause all hell to break loose, I could easily see it happening. He is this legend across the seas. And his death would spell, you know... The world government have been taking L's after L's. P Any's lobby has been made a mockery of. Now Impel Down has. Luffy, this this young upstart from their perspective, is tearing apart their entire reputation. They've been taking a bunch of L's. So I think from the perspective of the structure of the story, and, you know, there's no avoiding it, this story goes on for a thousand plus chapters at the very least. For the longevity of the story, the world government, I think, would have to maintain this, uh, this sense of power. They can't just be disposed of consistently. And a win on their end would be taking out Whitebeard, for sure. Now, of course, I would be disappointed if Whitebeard just showed up and a chapter or two later he's, de he's dead. Because I want to learn about a bit more about him. As I'll allude to later, um, we get some really cool stuff for how he's Ace's true uh, true father, for how he's had this huge impact on the seas, the legend that he is. I want to learn more about the man himself. Uh, we've got glimpses, but I want a bit more. If he's going to die, I hope there's more before that. Um, but maybe he won't die. I, so what I think is going to happen is either Ace uh, will, there will be a tragic inevitability to Ace's death, and then Whitebeard and Luffy and whatever may rally together to fight back long in the long term. Or... The opposite, maybe. Maybe Whitebeard will die trying to save Ace, maybe, um, and spark this new shift in ti the tides of power of momentum for the world government, and maybe Ace will join up with Luffy in some way. Maybe not become a straw hat, but... I don't know. So I think there's going to be a death, and I think I lean a bit more towards it being Ace, but I think it could end up being Whitebeard. I think there's there has to be a death in the next hundred chapters or so. I, th I just think there has to be. Those are the two at the top of my list. Number one, Ace. Number two, Whitebeard. But I could also see someone like Jinbei maybe dying. I could also see that easily. He is this monumental figure. Maybe Jinbei, actually. Uh, to, to start to go into sort of Fishman Island stuff, which we'll explore later, I'm sure. So those are the three names I have. In order of confidence, Ace, Whitebeard, 
pretty, uh, a little bit lower Jinbei. Those are the three I think that could die. Again, please do not spoil. Do not spoil a damn thing. Don't do this, don't ruin this for me. I've gone this far into the story without being spoiled, and I want that to continue. I think it's a miracle. Lots of people have told me that's a miracle. Please allow that to continue. My mods are prowling the comments. Any comments with spoilers will be deleted that may tell me, yes, Ace dies. Yes, Jinbei dies. Yes, uh, Whitebeard dies. Anything like that is going to be deleted immediately, so, so please don't do that, and... Uh, we've got a spam filter, it'll get caught in there, we got mods, and also just, if you've been watching, keeping up with these videos, please allow me to maintain this, this, uh, spoiler-free nature of it. I think that's a big part of what makes it so fun. But yeah, those are my theories, those are the themes I got from this arc, and let's dive into what actually happens. Firstly, though, let me just talk about the conclusion of the cover story with, uh, CP9. They do, like I said, they do a bunch of these jobs throughout to try to raise money for Luchi to be healed, um, they're rewarded for a lot of the things they do. There are lots of sweet moments, particularly the flower cover. They see that there's a new, uh, like, uh, a new younger, I guess, generation of CP9 being trained on their island. And there have been marines that were sent after them before, like, this is what we talked about before, I believe. Um, that was because of Spandam, who blamed the failure of Eni's lobby on them being the self-preserving asshole that he is. Um, and then Luchi kind of declares war on Spandam, which is awesome. So there seems to be some really... Uh, interesting brewing conflict between these two people who are, you know, allied before, but never saw eye to eye. And so it's cool that it looks like Spandum and Spandine was also in the cover story, may come to head with their whatever force and might they have at their disposal with CP9 one day. So I look forward to that. And then also with the cover stories, uh, the rest of the Straw Hats have been scattered all across the world, so we get little details of what they're up to, um, what Robin's up to. Uh, we see some Frankie, uh, a bit of... Nami and Sanji and Usopp, uh, just little flashes, but it's really nice. I think it's a really good way to keep up with them, even if they're not an active part of the arc. And let me just say, to do a whole arc, you know, not even one arc, two, I guess, because we have Amazon Lily, and that is like 35 chapters, something like that, without the Straw Hats that we've come to know and love and that are such an essential part of the journey, that takes tons of courage from Oda to do that. That is a hell of a move. Uh, that is a ballsy move for him to do that. So much respect for that, and it doesn't seem like they're anywhere close to being part of the story again as we head to Marineford. So for a monumental arc in the series to not include the Straw Hats, that is very risky, and so far it's paid off. We'll see if it continues. So we start in Empil Down with... Ace and Garp. Garp goes to visit Ace in prison, and uh, this is a really interesting way to start the arc. Ace says that he despises his father, who we assume is Dragon, um, and that he only has one true father, Whitebeard, like I've talked about before. And we see this flashback, a really quick flash, where we see Ace, who is younger, he's bloodied and beaten up, we don't really know the context, but he reaches out a hand to him, and he says, take my hand and we'll ravage the seas together. And so it looks to me from this that he saved his life, and so it's no wonder that Ace considers him his father. This is all we need for the details between them. I would like to hear more, maybe a bit more of a backstory, but that's just me being spoiled. For the purposes of Ace's connection with Whitebeard, this is all we need. Very minimalistic, very efficient, doesn't waste any time, and it helps me appreciate both Ace and Whitebeard more. But I love it. I love this little moment, uh, this beautiful element of found family, which is consistent throughout One Piece. It's no wonder that Whitebeard is his king, and he will make Whitebeard king of the pirates. Even if he loves Luffy, you understand just through this why he wants Whitebeard to become king. And after this, we get some flashes of in and around Impel Down to establish things. Now, it's very exciting because we know through the cover stories, again, being rewarded for paying attention to the cover stories, that uh, Baroque works are in Impel Down. Mr. 3, Mr. 2, Mr. 1, Sir Crocodile, and then a lot of the other ones kind of escaped earlier, but those are the main four at different levels. So that was so exciting going into it, knowing that Luffy was going to go into Impel Down. He was going to meet up with these characters who he'd seen before. Lots of different uh, feelings about all, all four of them. So that was a really great hook. But we also hear through Alvida and, and uh, her pirates, uh, who are uh, aligned with Buggy, of course, that Buggy's there. They leave him there, they think it's too dangerous, and 
to be fair, who can blame them for thinking that, and they kind of just abandon Buggy to his own devices. And so that's great character establishment throughout, but then in terms of tonal establishment or the establishment of what this place is, we've heard about it, we know what's going on here, but we see it once more. We see these scenes of torture, it is horrific. Uh, we see this great spread of under the underwater point of view. We see sea kings all over the place, brilliant blue water, and then impaled down in the center of it all, this corrupt place underneath the calm belt beautiful visual establishment, and Luffy and Boa enter, and there are 33 hours left until Ace's execution. Impel Down is super imposing, but both Luffy and Boa uh, are willing to enter for this. Uh, we get introduced to Domino and Hanyabal. Uh, Hanyabal's kind of interesting, some interesting stuff. I think I think we can talk about him uh, later. Don't have much to say about Domino, nor do I have to say much about Sadie, uh, for example, but it enriches the place to see these new characters who have these rules throughout the prison. There's some fun interaction throughout this. Boa is very savvy, very smooth, very pragmatic and smart, and plays it off really well so that Luffy's able to uh, escape and find his way into the prison. And he sneaks his way through, and we know he quickly meets Buggy, which is awesome. Uh, like I said, those interactions are great. But before he does, I, uh, it's really funny. Uh, I would like to see this animated, how they did in the anime, where Luffy mouths to her, uh, thank you, to Boa. And she goes, oh my god, he said I love you. Anyways, I thought that was really funny. But yes, he, he continues downwards. And he learns, uh, once he meets up with Buggy, they have this common goal. They want to be, escape this place. Buggy kind of goes along with him against his own wishes because he wants to go up, not down. But it's really funny how he gets dragged down regardless. Uh, it seems almost inevitable. Um, their interactions are so great, like I said. Tons of fun. I really like them together a lot. Uh, but we hear through this pretty natural exposition that Ace is down in level 5, the depths of level 5, in the absolute, uh, the bottom, the, the abyss of this place. And so Luffy sets out to do that, and despite Boa telling him don't cause a ruckus, him and Buggy cannot help but cause a ruckus. From minute one, there is absolute chaos and impel down, and it just compounds upon itself. Luffy's very one-minded and focused on his goal, whereas Buggy kind of swings back and forth between being um, a little malicious or antagonistic towards Luffy, and also being a little bit tsundere, um, some little hints of that. It's very fun. And so this is where we see the creativity that Oda's put into these different levels of torture. Like, how can I make this level worse than the last? How can I make this level, these levels, still very One Piece, but yet extremely dark? And I think Oda does a great job. This, for level one, crimson hell, these trees made of razor sharp blades, this is horrible. Like, these red, th these trees are painted red with blood uh, because of the, the way they cut and completely tear apart and slash at all the inmates. This place is horrible. And it's level one. And this is where the buggy kind of being roped into going with Luffy uh, happens because Luffy's just going, I need to go down to level five. And Buggy wants to go higher. He, he he wants to get the hell out of here. But at the same time, they're in tons of trouble. They're being chased by guards or whatever the hell's going on. And so he's just like, I might as well follow Luffy because if I stay here, it might be worse. So it's very funny in that way. So they continue this way and uh, Luffy jumps down into this pit into level two. And at this point, Buggy just goes, okay, no, I don't want to go further down. So uh, forget this. I'm going to ditch him. They're all going to go after Luffy while they're distracted. I'm going to escape. Cool. Awesome. But then he immediately gets pushed down and follows Luffy against his will into level two. <laughs> uh, and then we get a quick cut to see that Mr. Three is uh, in level two. And, you know, this is one of the most embarrassing moments I've ever had on stream. When we see him, for some reason... I got in my head that Mr. 2 Bonclay was actually Mr. 3 Bonclay. I mixed the numbers up, so I see the 3 on this guy's head, and I go, holy shit, nice, Mr. 2 Bonclay, awesome. Wow, he looks quite different, like he's been hardened by prison. I'm an embarrassment. I quickly found out, and chat quickly let me know that I was very wrong, but the damage was done. How did I mix them up? I don't know. I know now, though, and I will never forget who Mr. 2 is. Now, level 2 is the demonic beast level. There's all sorts of these horrific demonic beasts that are here. There's more Luffy and Buggy fun as they're terrified of the beasts, but uh, still fight through them and continue. We And then here we get introduced to Modulin and the establishment of his diarrhea thing, how he's the warden, uh, his role, and all that sort of thing. And I like his toxic powers. They almost feel metaphorical for this idea of poison, like the, the narrative that the world government spins 
It's almost like a toxin that infects everything around them, and anything it touches just decays. It feels a little metaphorical. I could be looking too much into it, but nonetheless, I think that tracks. Um, but here is where Buggy starts stumbling into becoming this revolutionary. It's crazy. He starts freeing all these prisoners, just just for the hell of it. He's just like, if I, if I free these guys, they'll owe me. Awesome. Completely self-serving. But... It genuinely starts working. It's genuinely smart. These prisoners who've been here for who knows how long, who are going to be subjected to torture, they're so thankful to be let out, and so they owe Buggy a debt. They consider him a savior. And this immediately becomes clear, and it just, like I said, like like other things throughout this arc, compounds itself the further we go on. And then they meet up with Mr. Three here. So we have this unlikely trio. Mr. Three, Buggy, and Luffy. Uh, we then get introduced as uh, Boa makes her way down to Ace. That's the... That's the uh, front she's putting up that she wanted to see Ace. As she's making her way down, we cut to Ace and we see Jinbei, who is being tortured, who has been tortured. And uh, this is where we get a lot of good establishment for Jinbei. Ace says that uh, Ace calls him boss, which is interesting. And he is tortured and he is in tons of external pain, Jinbei is. But he says his heart is what hurts because he would do anything to stop this war. And from this moment, I knew I would really like Jinbei. But I mean... I think I pretty much established how I feel about Jinbei so far, or in the video so far. He's just great. He's awesome. Um, uh, he's very heartfelt and, like I said, cut from the same cloth in a few ways uh, as Luffy. The miracle theme, I think, is really key in adhering himself to Luffy thematically. Will there be a moment in the future where, with his fixation on miracles, he looks at something that happens to Luffy and just goes, like, holy shit, this guy is the truth. Like, he already has respect for Luffy, but with his fixation on what miracles are and what they mean in this setting, I can see in the future that sort of scene happening. But he's a whale shark fisherman. Prior to becoming a warlord, he had a 250 million berry bounty. And this entire time, so cool, he's been putting up this front to the government to make it seem like he was working with them and that his goals align with theirs. But in the back, he had been dealing with, uh, he had been pretending to hate pirates, and he'd been dealing with... Uh, people like Whitebeard. He's been currying favor with Whitebeard to th to make things okay for his people, for Fishman uh, and and Fishman Island and all this stuff. It reminds me a little bit of uh, if you've seen Arcane, the deal between Vander and Grayson in, in Arcane. But Whitebeard is the reason that Fishman Island is safe. Uh, before it used to be persecuted, before the New Age of Pirates. But Whitebeard is the reason that Fishman Island is safe. The, that it can work as a sanctuary. It used to be persecuted after the New Age of Pirates started and people started running amok, which is really cool because it lends some nice darkness to the element of uh, what Roger did. Roger set off this whole New Age of Pirates with his death, and, you know, there are lots of positive implications of that for what it represented, for what it led Luffy to do, all that stuff, and that's really great. But, you know, in a world as sprawling and complex and epic and in scale as this, it will lead to lots of negatives too. This is one of them. We talk about it, and I can talk about Roger's death as this wholly positive thing, but I do want to stress that it was not. There are things, there are people, there are good people that were hurt by what Roger did, and it's not black and white. It aligns with Luffy as a person, and so we have a positive adherence to that. But that doesn't mean that it's unanimously utopic. So I love that detail. But because the New Age of Piracy caused this to happen, um, Whitebeard conquered the island and said, I declare this place to be under my protection. He put a safeguard around that. Jinbei obviously wants to protect it. He also just respects Whitebeard. He also just really likes Ace. He just is generally seems to be a good person, I think. Um, you know, I struggle to say that anyone in One Piece is a good person without knowing a bit more about them. We'll see. But given what we know so far, I think Jinbei is great. And it makes sense why he would want to stop this war. It's in, of course, there's self interest there. Um, he wants to save his home, or his people, but he also genuinely thinks it's what's good for the world at large. There can't be this war. And apparently Ace and Jinbei have faced each other before, but this is bigger than that. And this is where he says the line that he always believes in miracles and luck. And I won't repeat what I said about how that connects with Luffy. Uh, it's really cool though. A huge theme with Luffy and his straw hats is the improbable dream. Some would say a miracle. Some would say it would be a miracle for Nami to map the entire ocean. And so this connects with him in a really, really nice way. And then Croc walks in, his his entrance. I saw the anime clip, by the way, the uh, Mugiwara, beautiful stuff. And, and he walks in and he says that, oh, really? That's, what, that's what's going on here? 
I would like a, a bite of that. I'd like to take out Whitebeard myself. And so we have another cool collection of interactions here between Ace, Croc, and Jinbei, as Luffy and the others continue to make their way down. So given what Buggy's done, there are prisoners rioting, even more hell is breaking loose, the prison is absolute chaos, uh, they're fighting creatures, they're fighting this huge sphinx, um, They and then the floor breaks and they go down to level 3, and there they meet Mr. Two Bon Clay. Uh, and him and Luffy reunite, and it's really lovely, because this is the first time where Luffy sees a friend. And what happens here, actually, is before meeting him, he disguises himself as Zoro. So Luffy has this huge smile, he's beaming when he sees him. And so you feel very sad for Luffy, or I did in that moment, because what happened the last time he saw Zoro, he disappeared. Imagine how glad he was in that moment to go, Oh my god, it's Zoro, Zoro's back. At least I have my one crewmate back. But no, it ends up being Mr. Two. And it's not like he's disappointed to see Mr. Two, but in that moment, the amount of feelings and joy and holy shit, you're okay, the relief that he must have felt. I just felt really sad for Luffy there for a moment, but it's not like he holds it against Mr. Two. He's very glad to see him too, and it's very sweet. At Marineford, Garp is kind of just laughing upon hearing what Luffy's doing. He's very proud of him. Garp is really interesting. He's in he's in the Marines, he's perpetuating what's going on there, he's a cog, and yet he doesn't really care that Luffy is running amok. He's proud of him, in a way. And yet at the same time, that very uh, grandson of his, he tried to kill. Perhaps knowing that he'd survive regardless, but nonetheless, he legitimately tried to kill him. Garp is so interesting, and he gets more substantial later on. He, along with someone like Aokiji, I'd say, Garp and Aokiji are the two that I think keep me guessing the most. The two characters that have me most curious. Blackbeard, too. Uh, those three would be the ones that keep me guessing the most. They're just, they're there in the background. Who knows what they're going to do next? Who knows what's what different facets th to their character will be added to the richness we already have on display. Uh, they have me so hooked. But we're down in level 3 now, and what we have here is Starvation Hell. They're in this desert area, food is absolutely scarce, and yeah, this is where they are. Boa ultimately goes to meet Ace and talks to him, and Ace is informed here that... Uh, and she's guarded by Modulin the whole time, but Ace is informed here about what Luffy's doing through Boa. And he doesn't seem to like that. He's like, why is he doing this? This is a horrible idea. Do not do this. Do not make it down here. So there is this tone of trying to save me is not worth it, which only lends to the idea of the inevitability of his potential death. We'll see. But I was getting bad vibes about Ace's uh, longevity in that in that panel. Anyways, Luffy and Mr. Two team up. Meanwhile, Mr. Three and Buggy go their separate ways trying to, again, uh, self-preserve, which is fair enough understandable. Uh, but Mr. Two Bong Clay says to Luffy that I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you follow your, uh, to, to save your brother. We're friends, so I'm going to do that. Even if it's against my well-being, he's going to do that for him. Um, they kind of meet up again. They diverge again. It's super, it, it continues to be super chaotic. And in the midst of all this, somewhere around here in these chapters, there's this one of the funniest moments of One Piece. Uh, I put out a short about it, uh, my reaction to it. It is hilarious. It's, uh, there's this exchange where Buggy just is reminiscing on all the good times. And he goes, hey, Straw Hat, do you remember when I blew up that town using my special Buggy Balls? And Luffy just goes, no, I can't. And the face that str that Buggy makes, I'll try to remember to put it on screen. Oh my god, the, the expression there just completely took me out. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll put in the clip right here. Hey Straw Hat, do you remember when I blew up that town with my special Buggy Ball? No. <laughs> what? <laughs> What is this face? Oh, he's so sad. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so funny. Oh, my God. Poor Buggy. Poor Buggy. Do you remember when I blew up that town with my special Buggy Ball? No. Oh, he's so sad. I've never seen someone so sad in my life. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. He doesn't remember his buggy ball. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, holy shit! I couldn't help. I couldn't stop laughing. He was so dejected. He was so sad. Pour one out for Buggy. I will always remember Buggy's 
uh, special buggy balls. Uh, throughout in the midst of all this chaos, uh, buggy, or sorry, Mr. Tubon Clay says that, um, you know, we're heading down. There's also someone I would like to see there myself, who is uh, the queen of the Kamabaka Queendom, Evenkov, Eva, the world's greatest drag queen. So that's from the Kamabaka Queendom, uh, the island that Sanji was on in the uh, at the end of uh, Amazon Lily. But they keep going from strength to strength as they continue their momentum going downwards, and Luffy, we get this great uh, panel of Luffy grinning, like, nothing can stop us now, we're on our way to Ace, and then that's contrasted right away by Ace going, Luffy, do not come down here. And again, that inevitability, there is something at play here, There is there are reasons for Luffy to not do this. Um... Some could say from a shallow level it's the impending threat of just what Impel Down is, but I think there's more to it than that from a grander storytelling perspective. Uh, we cut to Boa, who has now left, and all she's thinking is that she really hopes that Luffy will be okay. There's 29 hours until Ace's execution, and she just hopes he hasn't bit off more than he can chew because she cares for him. Um, we go down to level 4, Inferno Hell, which is just people literally being cooked alive. Horrific. And at the same time, this uh, raid from Luffy and Co. has gotten has gone way too far, and Modulin and the other guards, the other wardens, and everything, they're gearing up to sort of take them and confront them and stop this. Because again, their reputation's at stake, they can't allow this to happen. And it's somewhere along in these chapters as well, where someone says that Whitebeard's death could uh, spell all hell breaking loose, which is what I referred to earlier, and the basis for some of my theories. Now, Modulin confronts Luffy and Mr. Tubon Clay, and in a very human moment, which I really kind of appreciated, Mr. Tubon Clay runs away. It's natural. Not everyone can be as courageous as Luffy or Zoro or whatever, and fear takes hold of him. And it's a very genuinely human moment. Some may call it cowardice. I just call it, you know, valuing your life. I think it's very human and it's very understandable. And yet it's also understandable for him to regret what he did, for him to hate himself for what he did, because Luffy is his friend. Meanwhile, Buggy and Mr. Three plan to take on Hannibal and make their way back up to level three. Uh, spoiler alert, they get beaten pretty badly. But that doesn't deter them. Anyways, Luffy is defeated pretty soundly by Modulin. The poison just makes its way through, courses through his veins, and starts disintegrating him. Like, literally. It's very rough to see. His face starts, like, literally decaying and rotting in front of our eyes. It's very disturbing to see. And he's thrown down into level 5, which is frozen hell, which I alluded to earlier. Uh, these people, the in sub-zero, horrific, freezing temperatures. And that's where Luffy is left to die. Now, the expressions go a long way here, as Mr. Two, again, Mr. Two Clay regrets doing what he did and plans to rescue Luffy goes back on his initial instinct, and the expressiveness really goes a long way, the illustrations in showing how much he regrets this, the crying, the tears, the exaggeration. You know, Oda's art style may not be the cu everyone's cup of tea. It isn't even my cup of tea. Uh, it's not the sort of thing I look for in an art style, but that doesn't mean I can't appreciate it and enjoy it for what it is and its strengths. And this sort of expressiveness in portraying what Mr. Tubon Clay is feeling is a prime example of that. And ultimately, he does what he thinks is right in the end. He goes back to save his friend. And there are these, there are a couple of parallels I made um, where Luffy kind of just uh, bangs his head against this wall trying to get to Ace, in futility. That reminded me a lot of Laboon. Laboon banging his head against uh, against the gate. Uh, also, as Mr. Two comes back to fight back to get Luffy, he fights all these wolves? That reminded me of Drum Island with Chopper trying to get the mushroom, the backstory. I don't think those parallels really mean too much, but nonetheless, from an aesthetic, shallow perspective, that's just what I thought of. Mr. Two sees uh, Buggy and Mr. Three again. He disguises himself as Hannibal and infiltrates downwards to go and save Luffy, fighting off those wolves, like I said. But ultimately, in the end, they're overpowered by these wolves and they both faint, but they're rescued by a mystery figure. Now, this ends up being Inazuma, uh, one of the revolutionaries, which is really cool. I thought this was initially Eva. That was my initial impression, but I was wrong. Now, from the perspective of Mr. Tubon Clay, he wakes up and he awakes in a dream in this paradise, this new comma, where we see Emporio Evenkov, Eva, in this place where people, uh, regardless of their gender, regardless of how they identify uh, in terms of their gender, all these people can find a home here in the middle of hell, which is crazy. It's like a, it's like an oasis in the middle of this desert. 
uh, of this hell. Gender here is whatever you feel. That's shouted to the mountaintops, and it's a beautiful sentiment. Now, there's this horrible, bigoted person whose dad, uh, they say, was in the Kamabaka Queendom and came back and decided he wanted, he wanted to become a woman. And Eva says, your dad wanted to become a woman? Deal with it. Respect it. Respect his wishes. And that's very nice. That's a very nice sentiment. Very progressive. And, you know, I've criticized uh, parts of this manga in the past and Thriller Bark, for example, for not aging well. So I think it's very appropriate to give props for Oda for being quite progressive in these ways. This this place where gender, um, whatever you feel, your identity, it's all respected very beautifully. Now, there is a interesting moment where Eva says deal with it to this guy and turns him forcibly into a woman, which it very much seems like he doesn't want. Um, but I think the sentiment here is very clear. Like, Eva is all for be whatever you want to be. So if this person ultimately goes to Eva and says, I don't actually want to be a woman. Could you please turn me back? I think they would do it. I think they would do it. No no questions asked. Because not doing so would just be completely in conflict with what they were just saying. But we find out, uh, Mr. Two finds out that Luffy, to heal from his poison, he is being subjected to the horm horm fruit, I believe it is. This hormone fruit, that this devil fruit that Eva's eaten, to restructure his biological, physiological outlook to get the poison out of his system. Now, this this fruit is interesting because it helps uh, change the physiology with regards to gender um, or the sexual characteristics of of anyone um, that Eva uses it on. And it also helps to transform Luffy's body. So cool application of that to get the poison out of there. But the catch is Luffy is going through immense pain. To drain this, this poison out of his system, it is painstaking. It is horrible. And he is screaming at the top of his lungs. And it is desperately difficult for Mr. Two to, to watch. And we learn from Eva as well that Luffy said prior to this, Please save Mr. Two as well, because he's my friend, which is very sweet. We also get a detail that doing this, subjecting Luffy to this treatment, may take 10 years off his life. Which, I mean, better 10, 10 years less than dying now, I guess. But nonetheless, I think that's pretty notable. But he also tells Luffy that this being successful depends on your willpower. And knowing Luffy, uh, I think he's going to be okay if it depends on willpower. Now, Mr. Two Bon Clay desperately. You understand his position. He can't bear to see Luffy like this, and he is struggling himself, and he's saying, stop it, save him, whatever, and Eva gives him a reality check, says, I am saving him. Miracles happen, Eva says, to those who don't give up. Again, that theme of miracles. And then you think, do miracles happen to Luffy because he perseveres so much? Or does he persevere so much because he gets rewarded? I don't think it's the second one. But nonetheless, I think there's an element of him just being having this cosmic luck and him making his own luck. I think it's both. I believe I talked about that in the Alabasta video. But this is a place of miracles and dreams. This fi level 5.5 5, uh, new comma. So Luffy surviving is an addition to that miracle. But then we get a bit of lore here. It was said that this level 5.5 .5 was dug up between levels 5 and 6. There's a secret level 6, where people who are banished by the government, who are written off by history, uh, go. As the government is wont to do, they love their reputation, they love spinning the narrative, so people just disappear down here. For whatever reason, they tell the public. This is only for the most atrocious criminals, though notably, they have the criteria. They write the cr criteria for what a horrible criminal is. The government, that is. Now, Eva says that if Luffy were to have done this earlier, it would have failed because there would have been a man named Shiryu of the Rain, uh, who used to be the head jailer. Him and Modulin seemed to have some sort of rivalry. They were more or less equal strength. They butted heads a lot. And there came to a point where Modulin stood up for the prisoners, whereas Shiryu said that they were uh, like trash. They were worse than trash. They were subhuman etc. And they seemed to come to blows, and Shiryu was dismissed or let go. And then he was in prison somewhere after losing uh, this. You'd assume he lost this. History is written by the victors, right? Uh, which is some interesting background information and establishment for Shiryu, which, uh, and tells you a little bit more about Modulin, which is interesting. Uh, Shiryu will come into play. I don't have a ton to say about him either, but he, I assume he'll have a role to play going forward. Uh, a very potentially devastating role. In the meantime, as Luffy is healing, uh, screaming, Mr. Tubon Clay starts this chant, just encouraging Luffy to survive. You can do it. And everyone joins in, and they do it for hours on end. Hours and hours and hours. And I love how he's able to do this for him, this spirit for his friend. And eventually, earlier than expected, I believe, Luffy makes it out. He opens the door and just says that he's hungry. He needs food. 
very Luffy, but it's lovely, beautiful, this support. Hours and hours of suffering from Luffy responded to with hours and hours of support, just screaming at the top of his lungs from Mr. Two. Um, after being awakened, Luffy thanks Mr. Two Monclay, essentially prostrates himself and says, thank you so much, I couldn't have done it without your support, which I agree with. I think there's something very special about what he did for him there. Uh, but Luffy eats eventually. Uh, and then he mentions that Dragon is his dad, which shocks Eva, because Eva, uh, little did we know until this point, was part of Dragon's revolutionary army. And Eva would note that in the past, there's a little uh, tiny tidbit of a flashback, Dragon would always look off somewhere, to the beyond. He seemed to be yearning for something. Eva question was that his family. Was it his family? Was it, was it, was he thinking of Luffy? I don't know, but he seemed to be always somewhere other than where he is now, in terms of his mind. He'd always be yearning for something, yearning to be somewhere else. Reminds me a little bit about, uh, of Jing from Hunter x Hunter in a way. Uh, his, his goal seemed to be somewhere beyond the horizon. So I really like that element added to Dragon. He is this revolutionary, he is this thorn in the world government's side, um, but he also has this, what seems to be heart to him. He has these desires and he yearns for these things. And I think it kind of helps inform why he said that he would never uh, prevent Luffy from continuing his conquest. Because he himself is always yearning for this next goal beyond the horizon. Something like that. I could be misinterpreting, but there's t just tiny little details, so I'm just spitballing. Um, but here, once once Eva hears about this, Eva Inazuma, who is also part of the, uh, the revolution under Dragon, they all decide that they need to come together and help Luffy save Ace. And more connections are formed, more comrades, that theme. The, it keeps building and building the people that Luffy allies with through these connections that propel him downwards and upwards. Now, while this happens, Ace begins being transported to Marineford. Now, they make their way down to Ace's cell, and they, very quickly, it was quicker than I expected, realize that he's not in a cell and that he's been taken out. And in a crazy move, but again, common benefits, mutual benefits, they release Crocodile, Sir Crocodile, and they release Jinbei, both of them because they will be assets to them going forward to escape. Is it ideal? Is it perfect? Is it the thing a hero would do? You know, Crocodile is one of the most dangerous people, as has been established so far, and Luffy is unleashing him on the, on the world, which, in its, we'll get to it in a second, but in itself kind of shows why Luffy's, Luffy's goals are a bit more complex than we may have thought at first, um, and maybe he'll see the, maybe he'll see that going forward. Regardless, he uh, helps Croc out, he helps Jinbei out, and them, along with Eva and everyone else, go back up to... They, they have to shift their plan from saving Ace here to going to Marineford to save him. Uh, but it's so great to see Crocodile back. It's so great to have his personality back. I enjoyed him immensely in Alabasta, as you guys know. And it's great to have him back here, this sort of taunting, very cynical sort of personality. Uh, it's great. I missed him. Um, but notably, he says he doesn't have any interest in Alabasta anymore which could show a shifting of the motives, or maybe just the fact that he's been shown that at this point it's really not on the cards. But in saving Jinbei and getting in springing out Jinbei, Jinbei says, please let me out, and like, I want to stop this war, please believe me, and Luffy gives him one of those piercing Luffy looks, and his intuition tells him, I can trust him. And I think he's right. I think he's right on that one. They're cut from the same cloth, and I think he might be able to tell. Uh, and what a crew we have to go, to get out of here, to go to Marineford. Um, it leads to some awesome spreads, some awesome panels, almost like movie poster-esque, as we see Eva, Inazuma, Croc, Luffy, Buggy, Mr. Three, Mr. Two, just these great, they look like movie posters, some of these spreads. They're awesome. But with these people in tow, with these allies, a uh, culmination of their powers, they are able to get out. You know, Crocodile working together with Jinbei and Eva. It's just, it's just really cool. Uh, it's just so cool. I don't know. It, it feels like fan service, but it really isn't. It really isn't. It's just, this is how the story organically came together. And seeing these people interact and work together is such a treat. So they're escaping up from level six now. They, they're on their way up. Uh, Shiryu offers his services to, to help uh, combat this. And throughout there are awesome fights, uh, Croc, Jinbei, and Luffy taking on these guards, taking on the forces, Eva doing their thing. Uh, 
it's just so much fun. I can't overstate at all how much fun I had just seeing these interactions between these characters. It's a joy. These characters, I don't, I don't think they'll be together forever. I think this might be a unique one-time thing. Maybe this arc going into Marineford. So I really decided to to soak it all in. And maybe, maybe I could see Luffy and Jinbei fighting together again, considering how alike they are in a few ways, but Crocodile, I, I don't think so. Uh, meanwhile, Buggy and Mr. Three, this mustache twirling duo, continue to do their thing. They're so, they're great together, and they're releasing more prisoners. Uh, this alerts Hanya Ball, this alerts more people, this, this causes this to gather pace, and there's more chaos, more entropy, and it's here where we get more panels of these prisoners that are just celebrating Buggy as their savior. It's un, you know, it's unintentional, but it's kind of intentional at the same time. He does want to save them to cause this ruckus and escape, um, but he doesn't quite, uh, it's funny because he just doesn't quite realize the the extent to which his charisma is being adhered to by these people, the gravity of which, uh, of what he's doing for them. He is changing their lives, he is saving their lives by doing this, and in doing so, he is garnering immense support that may be there with him for the long term. Like I said, he it's not all luck, it, there's a bit of luck involved of course, like there is for Luffy, but he's, uh, he stumbles his way into becoming this revolutionist and this savior. And his motives are not really understood by those around him, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter at all. He is helping them get out. I don't think they care whether he uh, thinks it's for his own selfish means or not. He's he's being misunderstood. And, and I said this on stream, maybe he'll misunderstand himself into becoming king of the pirates one day. Who's to say? But none of this matters as if his actions are beneficial for these masses. He will garner this following, and he has. It's crazy to sl slowly see this snowballing effect of the people that Buggy saves becoming this genuine, like, army for him. But in the midst of this, Sir Crocodile springs his first mate of sorts, uh, Mr. One. So we have gone to the deepest pits of hell, and we are on our way back. And throughout this, just like the rest of the world government officials we've seen, we have these wardens or these people that say they enact justice, but they're really, really, in a lot of ways, narrow-minded, uh, oblivious, blindsided, and full of shit. That's just how it is. Um, is what Luffy's doing perfect? No and I'm about to get into that. But nonetheless, a lot of the ideals that these people tout, a lot of the moral high ground, it's just completely empty, full of hot air. Ace has begun being transported. He's taken out of Impel Down, and he's taunted by someone who's transporting him, saying, take a look at the sky. That's the last time you'll see the sky as a free man. You're about to die, all that sort of thing. And the expressions are very somber. You know, we've seen Ace as this, as this very uh, boisterous, enthusiastic, energetic personality, this inspirational figure, but these expressions coming from him are very sobering. And like I said, this all adds credence to the idea that, you know, it's saying so often that, yeah, he's gonna die, he's gonna die, that it makes you want to think that he's not going to, but maybe in the end he will. I, don't, I talked about it earlier, I won't repeat myself. Will it be the miracle that couldn't be done? But here in this moment, Blackbeard takes it upon himself to go to Impel Down. Uh, against the wishes of what anyone in the world government would want him to do. He takes his crew there, and his motives? I have no clue what's going on here. Because before, he wanted to gain notoriety to get influence to become uh, a warlord through capturing Luffy. That was his goal before. Now that he's a warlord, what does he actually want to do here? What is he actually trying to do? We know he has a lot of commonalities with with Luffy ideologically, philosophically, but there are key ways in which they diverge. So with the influence that he gained, that was his goal, he now uses that influence to storm Impel Down. What is his plan here? I have no clue. But things are reaching a boiling point. Luffy and the others are around level 4? 5 going into 4? Uh, Buggy is a couple levels higher, and... Blackbeard at the front, at the at the front of, of Impel Down. So so there are multiple levels of chaos. Uh, we get some nice bits of Shiryu here, where he's uh, gets his sword say, after saying he'd help, and he cuts down some soldiers, and he says that boredom is worse than death. Very kind of very kind of raw character, just from the glimpses we see. And very quickly, he meets Blackbeard. They confront one another. It's there's utter chaos everywhere, but it's so so awesome seeing these team ups and these characters interact. And ultimately, like I said, Shiryu meets Bla meets Blackbeard. But what happens is we see very soon after that that Blackbeard gets past him. So to skip ahead, we know that Shiryu let him through. They meet and they seem to respect one another. 
Uh oh. The escape continues and uh, Eva decides to be a woman, so changes form using the, the fruit, the fruit powers, and uh, Hannibal. So here we get some really interesting stuff. Hannibal confronts Luffy and the party and everyone and proves to be an obstacle. And Luffy very quickly dispatches of him. He overpowers him pretty quickly. And at this, Hannibal, in this really well-illustrated panel from the perspective of him, as he's struggling to get up, says things from the perspective of someone who views pirates as evil, wrong. Blanket statement for all pirates, including Luffy. And he has this really interesting speech. He says that all of them are pirate scum. He says that he doesn't deserve to save his brother. Luffy doesn't deserve to save Ace because they're both lawless, they're wicked. They have order right now, and he is causing all hell to break loose. There will be... Uh, blood on the seas. And he says that through Impel Down, through what the world government does, they preserve order and safety throughout the sea. If you break this, you are disturbing that order. People will not feel safe across the world. Impel Down is a safeguard, and it is what prevents this terror. And he can't stand that someone would try to desecrate such order. And it's an interesting perspective. Um, it's an interesting perspective that I'm glad we have, especially from someone who seems to be Again, kind of a cog in the machine. We don't know about his upbringing. We don't know whether he's been indoctrinated or if he came to believe this gradually through whatever means. We simply don't know. But regardless, it's an interesting perspective for Oda to show us here. Because uh, the first thing that it brings about, I, I had a really cool, I had a really interesting conversation with my chat that went on for like an hour about these sorts of things, these sorts of themes and different perspectives and how to view it. So a bunch of these topics I would like to, to credit my chat for because I didn't come up with all of them organically. There are things, some things here that I didn't think of organically. But something that's very clear through this is that it, it definitely shows that Luffy's dream will have these knock-on effects that make it not so simple. Like we said about Roger, we look at what he did through setting forth the new pirate age to be uh, utopic, unanimously positive. But it's not, as we see through what happened to Fishman Island. And it's true. There are good pirates, like Luffy, and they are representative of our perception of pirates. Kind of similar to how there are bad people in the world government, in the marines, whatever. But just as there are good people in the marines, there are bad pirates. We've seen plenty of them. And so, in doing this, in breaking out of Impel Down with people like Crocodile, you are setting that lawlessness, that anarchy out on the world, and it will harm innocent people. I think that's undeniable, and that is definitely a point that is true for with what Hanyabal says. And it shows that Luffy's goals are not very simple. They will have knock-on effects on the whole world that he will have to take into account. He can't ignore that, but it's a byproduct of his goal to save Ace. What Luffy's doing here is dangerous. Not for himself, not just for himself, but to innocent people across the sea. So he has to really feel the weight of that. I think it's his responsibility to. In the end, Impel Down is the way that order is maintained. It keeps pirates in check. It, it, it's true. There are bad, very bad criminals that are in Impel Down. Crocodile is a great example of that, who are not set out on the world because they are, they are stored there. So what Hannibal is saying here does have weight. Luffy is kind of opening Pandora's box by breaking Impel down here. Maybe Pandora's box is overstating the consequences a bit, but at the very least, this will have some dark implications. Buggy, who knows what Buggy's gonna do? But at the end of the day, while Hannibal does have a point here, while I see it, and while I'm glad it enriches the story, what does he expect? How can you have anything to complain about? when people need to break into and out of Impel Down to save loved ones who are unlawfully detained and tortured, and there is no rehabilitation, there's dehumanization, there's corruption. Impel Down is bad for all the ways we've seen explained to us before. The torture, um, the way that, for example, Ace, Ace's presence there at all. Uh, for example, Robin. Robin was about to be taken there having done nothing wrong, and she was going to be tortured inhumanely. There are tons of innocents here. There are tons of people who do nothing wrong. There's no rehabilitation. There is a sadistic element to the torture that happens here. So with this corruption that's been established for Impel Down, what do you expect? What, what do you expect? Of course people are going to break into it. Of course they're not going to care about the consequences when their loved ones are being unlawfully detained and tortured. Jinbei's there when he doesn't deserve to be there. To me, it's just faux morality to chastise them for this. Yes, what they're doing is imperfect, they never pretended to be heroes. Luffy never pretended to be a hero. He's just been someone who wants to save his brother, who is going to die. He doesn't want his brother to die. And what has happened to Ace, this unlawful detainment and this unlawful execution, 
is uh, an encapsulation, a succinct examination of the sort of thing that Impel Down does over time to so many people. So when it is built upon this corruption, what? of course this is going to happen. This is always going to happen. Not saying that what Luffy's doing is good or heroic or uh, that he's a paragon of virtue, but how can anyone within Impel Down complain when they're perpetuating this horrible, horrible culture? Order is maintained, but only through oppression, torture, pain, bloodshed, overwriting history, lying to the masses, corruption. And also the standards by which people are said to be criminals, to be taken in here, are set by the world government. They literally give the outlines, whatever they say goes. So when they consider someone to be a threat, yep, you're in here, get in the brig. But there's no, there's no pushback anywhere. They set the rules and no one argues against them, as far as I know. As far as I know, I don't know. That's, that's just what I know at this point, maybe I'm wrong. But if I'm not, I mean, hey, that's... That even lends more credence to the corruption here. So I love this line from ha Hannibal. I think it's great. I think it shows a very interesting perspective that is, uh, that I'm glad Oda dwells upon. From my perspective, though, he's full of shit. He's full of it. I don't think he has anything to complain about. If your order is founded on the backs of such pain, corruption, torture, dehumanization, whatever, of it was, it was always on borrowed time. Someone was always going to try to overthrow this. So how can you even complain? If their order was... You know, no, nothing's perfect, but if their order was, while, while imperfect, just not corrupt in the ways it is, then yeah, I could see where he's coming from. If Ace had genuinely done something worth being executed over, I could see where he's coming from, but none of that's true. So, I think he's full of it. But still, I'm, that's not me criticizing anything. In fact, I love this. I think it's a very awesome perspective from someone who just is blindsided. And I think many perspectives throughout One Piece are blind to a bunch of things. Someone in my chat said that Hannibal's uh, reminds them of T-Bone from the Sea train um, portrayed as selfless people or people who may, in another world or something, be good. They're fighting for what they think is right, but they can't differentiate between good or bad, only lawful and unlawful, and they conflate that. That was something that was said in my chat, and I think that's a great way of putting it. And related to this, yeah, this shows how complex Luffy's goal is. It shows a dark tinge to what Luffy's trying to do and how he has to keep that, take that into consideration. It's his responsibility. A dark tinge to Roger. And if you think of, like, Kobe trying to change the Marines from within. Someone asked me, do I think that, with this knowledge and this discussion, do I think that Kobe's dream, what do I think of Kobe's dream? And I said that at this moment of time, I think it is not possible right now. But I think it's possible in the long term. And overall, I think it's an improbable dream. Just like Luffy has, just like the rest of the crew has, Kobe is kind of a almost antagonistic straw hat in that way. Idealistically, he's very similar to them, and I think that I can envision a future where his ideal vision of the Marines take shape, but not yet. It's too deeply rooted. It needs to be it needs to be pulled up from the roots. Cause like yes, the Navy has to exist, order has to exist because pirates can be awful people. But the fact, the, the fact is, the Navy, as it currently is, needs change. The Navy needs to be there for order. There has to be an element of that. But as it currently is, it is under the umbrella of the world government, and it all being under this one entity, I know it's distinct, but at the end of the day, they're under the same umbrella. Something needs to change there. Like, you think of Garp and his role, Aokiji. It just brings a lot of interesting topics to the fore. Kobe's role, it just, I love the thoughts here. I, I love all the themes that can be tackled here, the discussions that can come about, and let me know what you think about any of these things. They're very interesting and nuanced topics, so I'm sure plenty disagree. Um, those are just my thoughts on it, having read it very recently. Um, as I sit more with these thoughts, as I read more of the story, I'm sure they'll mature and develop. Those are just my initial thoughts. But after this, Hannibal is punched into the ground by Blackbeard, who shows himself and confronts Luffy for the first time in ages, as we see this awesome spread, and he reveals that Ace is in jail, about to be executed, well, not in jail anymore, but about to be executed thanks to him. Amazing spread in this face-off, and Luffy recognizes him. And what I alluded to earlier is that Blackbeard basically tells Luffy the reason Ace is captured in this way is because a bunch of circumstances happened, and basically, Blackbeard wanted to get Luffy to gain notoriety to become a warlord, but Ace got in the way. And so he says that fate protected Luffy. That's why he's still standing. That's why Blackbeard didn't go after him in the end. He says, fate protected Luffy, conflating fate with Ace. That's an interesting thing. And again, that theme of fate, that constant theme 
associated with Blackbeard and his crewmate who constantly talks about fate. And they start sparring, but Jinbei, in a, an amazing moment, says to Luffy, stop it. Do not fight him. We have other reasons. We have to move past this. And this this is kind of the last part of the trifecta so far um, of people inspiring Luffy or teaching Luffy lessons. The first was Vivi on Drum Island, telling him to not be reckless. The second was Iceberg, schooling him in uh, Water 7, telling him what a true captain should do. And third here from Jinbei, I think this is very much along those same lines, telling him, this is not your fight. Focus on your task ahead. Ignore him. And so I love the three sort of mentors here in different ways. Vivi, Iceberg, and Jinbei. All having an impact on Luffy, all giving him this wisdom and advice that is very positive and contributes to his goals, and I think can only help him become more wise. An interesting exchange happens here where Crocodile talks to Blackbeard and says, um, you've lost your title as Warlord through doing this, probably. And Blackbeard says, no matter. Uh, this is all according to plan. What plan? I still don't know. Buggy continues his revolution. Uh, Luffy says to Blackbeard that he's still going to save Ace. And Blackbeard says, maybe you will, you know. It's not impossible. After all, Sky Island existed, right? And he says, along with this, the impossible, these miracles, these dreams, dreams do exist, which he said from the beginning. And along this line of thought, Blackbeard says... So that means the One Piece must exist. It has to exist. It definitely exists. I think definitely is the word he uses. The One Piece definitely exists. And so here is where I find a bit of a foil between him and Luffy. They're alike in the way they think about dreams and freedom and uh, a true pirate, the core of a true pirate spirit. But this line really shows, I think, a bit of a difference between them. It's been established from the start, from the Gaimon chapter, that Luffy doesn't care if the One Piece exists or not. What matter? And in fact, he literally told Usopp he'd stop on his on his adventure if he found out if it existed or not. It doesn't matter to Luffy because the path on the way to getting the One Piece is the reward, is the reason he's doing it. Self fulfilling prophecy almost. So he doesn't want to know if it's if it's real or not. He doesn't care. It doesn't matter to him. It's an abstract thing. It's an abstract conduit for adventure and freedom and dreams. But for Blackbeard, he seems to expect these things to exist. He seems to want them to exist. Maybe need them to exist. Whereas Luffy doesn't need them to exist at all. He focuses on the end goals by saying the One Piece definitely exists. It definitely exists. Whereas Luffy couldn't care less if it exists. So that's an interesting foil between the two. An interesting difference, a contrast. It makes me wonder... What happens to Blackbeard if he were to find out that the One Piece didn't exist? Or find out that one of his goals was empty or didn't exist? Would he take solace in the journey? Or will he, because he was focusing on the end goals, be devastated or angry? Either way, I think that's a contrast between the two that I think might be very telling. Luffy doesn't need the One Piece to exist or these goals to exist, these physical manifestations of his dreams to exist, because he is there for the journey. Whereas Blackbeard is really focused on whether or not they exist. I don't know, I'm just spitballing, but that seems to be a really clear thematic difference between the two. Chaos continues, Blackbeard faces off with Modulin. It is hard to uh, articulate how chaotic this, this has gotten. Eva and Inazuma kind of stay behind to help, help out. Mr. Three, in a great moment, kind of holds back and defends uh, with his candle wall and or whatever in a in probably my favorite moment for mr three so far it was really nice as he tried to help luffy go forward and there's a great moment where croc sees mr three after they reunite because they reunite here with buggy mr three and all the prisoners and croc just goes mr three you're here eh and kind of like is very condescending to him I, I liked it i liked it a lot just oda putting these characters in the same spot and just letting them naturally go wild and interact is wonderful ultimately they break out to the entrance of uh impel down but all the ships have been taken yet that inspires jinbei or kind of is the catalyst for jinbei to do his thing where he propels <laughs> mr one buggy and um, and Sir Crocodile to the ship, to a ship, and they take it over. But there's this panel, amazing panel, where he's just kind of like a motor underneath, and on top of it standing are Buggy, this great pose, his hair flowing in the wind, uh, Croc looking raw and and uh, cool as always, and badass as always, and Mr. One just kind of standing there and vibing. Uh, someone described it as an album cover, I see that for sure. That was awesome. And Jinbei just continues to be great. Meanwhile, this is what's 
happening at the surface. Luffy is not quite there yet, and he's fighting with Modulin. And Modulin, ultimately, Luffy just decides, like, I can't take this guy, I gotta run. Which again shows his immaturity, or sorry, his maturity. Uh, he would not run from losing battles before. Yet at this point, he realizes there's a bigger picture. He has to save Ace. Uh, he can't win this, just like on Sabaudi, where he told his crew to, to leave. Similar, similar case here. He can't take on Modulin, so get out of here. Live to fight another day. Live to save Ace. And I think that also helps with the, the scale of this. There are people here that vastly overpower Luffy at this point in time. That's just the truth of it. Modulin is one. Kuma was another. Um, Sentomaru and, and all that stuff from Sabaudi. That is the scale of what they're taking on. Meanwhile, in the midst of this, which I forgot to, uh, this might have been in an earlier chapter that I forgot to mention, a very interesting note is that Eva seems to hold something, uh, hold some information that Crocodile is insecure about. Some sort of detail, some sort of dirt on Crocodile. And I don't know exactly what this might allude to, but maybe something to do with why he's so cynical. We know he wanted to be a hero, we know he's very cynical, we know he doesn't believe in dreams. So maybe something to do with his childhood experiences or past experiences and why he's come to be this way? Either way, don't know exactly, but could lead to something very interesting for some crocodile character work. But at the end of this, after going onto the ship, Jinbei, in the sort of culmination of the theme of connection, calls forth these whale sharks that come and save them all. Luffy, every single person, except one, which we'll get to in a second, uh, escapes on these whale sharks. Who And it's just this... In the, in the midst of this hellish arc, this journey to hell and back, at the end we have this serene, serene spread of these whale sharks saving everyone. Adorable expressions um, done through this friendship between Jinbei and them, carried forward by this bond that Jinbei has with Luffy, that Luffy has with all these people. The theme of connection really shows here, and it saves the day, and it's the reason they escape. However, they are still barred. Modulin isn't panicking because the gates of justice are still closed. One person stayed behind, and that was Mr. Two, disguising himself as Modulin to say to open the gates and let them out. Meanwhile, he gets barged in on by the real Modulin, and oh, the jig is up. The, we find out that this is a sacrifice he did twice now to save Luffy because he's his friend. And it's just a beautiful, heart-wrenching scene because... He calls them on the snake or snake snail transponder, and you know it's clear what's going on here. And so Luffy and the rest, and they're all saying, "Don't do this. We'll come back for you. Come with us." But that slowly transitions over to from them begging him to come back to them acknowledging that this was his choice to make, his decision. He knows the ramifications, and to acknowledge and respect that, it goes from "Come with us," begging him to "Thank you." Thank you for doing this for us. And that shift is lovely because it helps to not put a burden on him. It helps to acknowledge the sacrifice and pay it back with gratitude and acknowledge it was his choice to make. And he knows better than anyone what that meant to him and if it was worth it. And he wouldn't have done it if it wasn't worth it. And so the sentiment changes, like I said, from please come with us, don't do this to thank you for doing this. And I think that's lovely. Uh, even Buggy is moved to tears and going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for being such a pain, thank you. It's a beautiful moment. And my appreciation for Mr. Tubonclay shot up for sure after this stuff. And then we get this quote that really kind of sums up a lot of the themes of Impel Down. It's narrated and it says that the flower of friendship can bloom even in hell. And there's more to it, alluding to the potential death of Mr. Two. I think he'll still survive somehow. I think somehow he will. Nonetheless, I digress. Back to the point. That is an encapsulation of Impel Down. The flower of friendship can bloom even in hell. Mr. Two and Luffy had struck up this bond. Um, even if they just had just met each other this, this, um, this tiny amount of time, they had this strong bond. And that hadn't been severed. It was strong as ever when they met each other in Impel Down. And it blossomed even more in the midst of this hell. Even in this horrible place. They were able to connect with one another and help one another, and it was beautiful. And I think that extends to other characters. I think it can extend to Luffy and Eva. They formed a bond here. They formed a friendship. Uh, Luffy and Jinbei. So it particularly pertains to Mr. Two, but I think it encapsulates a lot of what this arc is about, and it's beautifully poetic. Luffy went down to hell, found friends, tried to save his brother, 
the relationships bloomed and he made his way out and those relationships were much better for it and so last we see of mr two he's kind of confronted by modulin and the implication is that he could die here I don't know. I don't believe that he's going to die. We'll see how it goes, though. The main point at the end of this, the exclamation point, is that, as it says, Luffy and his friends have made, uh, and his comrades, I guess, because Crocodile isn't quite his friend. Nonetheless, Luffy and them have made a reputational disgrace of Eni's lobby, or uh, of Impel Down, in addition to Eni's lobby. He's making a little bit of a collection here. He's making disgraces of these so-called fearsome places, and, and he is weakening the front of oppressive impressive oppressiveness of the world government through these things and it's not like these fronts were immaterial they were fearsome and his lobby was fearsome until luffy got there impel down was fearsome until luffy got there but what's key here is that it says that the story is not yet done as we head over to impel down with an impending execution that is ominous now we see that shiryu has joined the blackbeard pirates that's scary. So that's bubbling in the background. We'll see what Blackbeard's cooking. Really, really interesting. Uh, and then on the ship as they're getting away, Jinbei reveals that he's a warlord. Uh, Luffy is very shocked by this. There's some fun interactions throughout, but then eventually Luffy gets a call from the Navy, and he hilariously answers. Uh, like the call is, "This is the uh, this is the Marines. This is Marine headquarters." And Luffy just goes, uh, "Hi, this is Luffy." <laughs> Just so matter of fact and simple. No lying, no concealing whatsoever. And they tell him that him and Buggy have been earmarked as the spearheads, the two main main spearheads of this breakout. And like I said earlier, like I alluded to earlier, uh, Sir Crocodile was essential. Jinbei was essential. They wouldn't have been able to do it with either, either of them. Eva, absolutely significant. But I think it's fair to say that these two... Um, are two of the most influential, potentially the most influential here, uh, of, if you look at the scale of the jailbreak, those two may have contributed the most. And it feels funny because it's buggy, but if you look at what he did, he literally led a revolution of prisoners. He freed all of them. They all escaped. So it makes sense, even though you could argue for, maybe it should have been Jinbei instead, maybe it should have been Eva instead. Fair. But I don't think you can say that it doesn't make sense that Buggy is the face of it as well. But now he's wanted. And they explain that it's partly due to his ties to Roger, which had been discovered. Uh, his blood brother Shanks, which is discovered, uh, who's obviously against them. And all these revelations are coming to the front to the fore. And the people that think of Buggy as a savior, they're like, holy shit, he's even more impressive than we thought. The Marines also think that he wants to save Ace, which is funny considering that him and Ace did have a good relationship, but no, he just wanted to get out of there. Uh, there's a nice moment as Luffy mentions Rayleigh, and uh, Buggy is like, oh, how's that old guy? He seems to have a bit of fondness for him, which is quite sweet. But uh, this is where it kind of put an exclamation mark on why I think Buggy is such a cool, really interesting character. Not just in terms of personality, fun interactions, he's consistently engaging on screen, but his arc is so unique within the scope of One Piece. As he falls upward, like I said, he stumbles, and yet it's not all due to luck, he has a unique charisma, and he brings results, he freed these people. So, these people say that they want to follow him. They will take. They will go wherever he wants to go. And he's hesitant. He's like, I don't know what to do here. This notoriety makes me a little uneasy. But then he also thinks, they love me. Ah, uh, this feels good. I like this feeling. I don't want to let this go. And of course it does. It feels good to have people celebrate you and call your name. And then he gets a little more ambitious. He thinks, if we storm Marineford, maybe I could kill Whitebeard and become an emperor. I mentioned this earlier. Don't know about that, but I mean, who who the hell knows? Who knows if he could even stumble into becoming King of the Pirates and Luffy has to has to beat him and something. I envision like maybe at, maybe Endgame One Piece will have Kobe being representative of the Marines, uh, Buggy being the head of some sort of anarchist revolutionist group and luffy maybe they're the three main figures of the sea i don't even know i could see the trajectory of the series going that direction and i think this if it does for buggy this is an influential moment because he gets greedy here uh, what overtakes him more than anything is a desire to be king to be celebrated this ego i love it it's so delectably dark and he thinks that he can ride this momentum and stardom and uh, this this charisma he has to potentially 
making his way over to Whitebeard and doing what he needs to do. And he thinks to himself, like, a lot of these guys have higher bounties than me, so they'll get more attention. Well, I guess, but also, Buggy, like, your bounty is going to go up after being decidedly one of the top two most influential people in the outbreak of Impel Down, this historic disgrace. Your bounty's going up, my dude, so I think he kind of uh, overlooked that part. Regardless, he's power hungry, he's greedy, he's he's finding himself in this position of leadership, and I think this can say quite a lot about what Oda is saying about people who find themselves in positions of leadership. Uh, that's the state of society, that's the state of the world. People who have heinous desires, who are self-interested, who don't care about others. Like Buggy, with charisma, with some impressive feats admittedly, for sure, like I keep saying, can find themselves in positions of power, and that is dangerous. It is, this is awesome, really cool, thematic writing for Buggy, and not just thematic and mechanical stuff, and not only just promising for the trajectory of the rest of the series and his role in it, but also just, he was consistently engaging on screen. His arc, his development, his progression is so much fun. And like I said, I'm getting it. I'm getting the Buggy lo love now. I'm going to title this video something to do with Buggy. But Buggy says, let's do it. We're going to rule the world one day, and we're going to get Whitebeard's head. And they go, yeah. And I don't think Luffy's down with that plan, but nonetheless, they all want to go to Marineford. So Luffy with Buggy, with Croc, with everyone, they make their way there. And there's a moment where things change with, with Buggy, um, where his hilarious um, greed turns into genuinely serious, maybe dark ambition. This is where he feels like he genuinely believes in himself. It reminds me a little bit of, like, Usopp. Usopp's arc, uh, journey to believing in himself, believing that he can be this brave warrior. Buggy starting to believe that he can become this really brave leader. It's really interesting. And Buggy's arc is just as human and, you know, ebbs and flows as, as Usopp's. It's really cool. I, I, I find that parallel interesting. It's a big commentary on leaders, uh, how it can be a farce how some people go into leadership, or maybe it is a farce that people with those intents can go into leadership. Yet nonetheless, like I keep saying, Buggy did do some impressive things. He has been genuinely inspirational to these... He has been genuinely inspirational to these people. He has this unique charisma, like I said. Anyways, we cut to Marineford, and Ace makes his way over to the gallows, and... The expression, once again, very sobering expression on his face as he makes his way over. And, uh, wow. It is just, um, we see it, we see these interspersed little flashes of him and Luffy as kids. As he has this sad look in his eyes. And we see him telling Luffy to embrace life and live with no regrets. To live a life of true freedom. And we see here that he may have been as inspirational and foundational for Luffy's goals as Roger, as Shanks. And maybe his death, if it happens, could continue to have that impact on Luffy. So to end this video, I read one chapter into Marineford, chapter 550. I was recommended to read this, and I'm glad I did, because, wow, what an establishing chapter. Probably the best first chapter of any arc. The atmosphere builds, the grand epic scale builds, as we see we go throughout the sea. South blue, east blue, west blue, people discussing what's about to happen at Marineford, and sharing the legacy of this impressive living legend that is Whitebeard. They have so much faith in him, he's such a, an icon, a symbol. And wow, this is where you feel his absence so strongly. There have been lots of, the, lots of building for Whitebeard. And is, when's he going to come? Is he going to come now? Is he going to rescue Ace? Is he going to go to Impel Down? Is he going to go to Marineford? I think it's clear he's going to go to Marineford eventually. Uh, very soon, because he's going to die in three hours. But his absence is felt and builds his presence through absence. It's really interesting. It's just so ominous. When is he going to come? For people in-universe as they await him, and for me as I anticipate him. It's ominous how he doesn't show himself. So when he does, oh, it is going to be momentous. And Ace... They bring him to the to the platform. He is to die very soon. Three hours, like I said. And again, a visual allusion to Roger. I'm not going to get into my theories. I talked about my theories about could Whitebeard die? Could Ace die? I even threw in Jinbei. But uh, I'm not going to repeat myself. You can check the theory section of the video if you missed it, where I talk at length about my theories about who could die going forward. Potentially in the next video, we'll have a death. We'll see. But nonetheless, it's great establishment, great great building of, of the tension here. And we have so many spreads. We have spread after spread. First, an establishing spread of Marineford. It is this 
beautiful looking fortress island. Internally, right in the middle, there is this fortress. Uh, cannons around it. It seems impregnable. And then yet surrounding it are residences, houses. It's a fortress island full of residences where people live here. And yet outside of it, almost sandwiched between it, is cannons. Cannons to defend the ports, the, the shore. And boats lined up all around it. Uh, I think it was said that in, that uh, Marine Fort is kind of in a crescent shape, and the fortress is kind of the tip of the crescent, then the residences, then the uh, the armories, the, the defenses on the shore, and a little off the shore, the, the battleships. It's, I just love how it's uh, visually shown, drawn. It's awesome. The colors are amazing, and we see everyone is here. We have Smoker, Tashigi. Uh, they're here, of course. We knew they were gearing up to go. And honestly, I, I can imagine other familiar faces showing up here with how monumental this is. Whitebeard's gonna come. Ace is already here, obviously. He's the center of all this. Luffy and his crew are all coming. Buggy, Croc, what are they gonna do here? It's crazy. Jimbei, what's he gonna do? Uh, Luffy, we know what he's gonna try to do. Could someone like Shank show up? I think anything's on the table here. And then we see the warlords are all gathered here. Mine is Jinbei, obviously, and mine is Blackbeard. Would he come back? I don't know. Uh, we don't know what his goal is, but we'll see how it plays out. Nonetheless, the spread of the of the Warlords is amazing, especially in color. Mihawk looks great. Boa, gorgeous. Um, we see Gecko Moria. The you guys know I really dig his character, and we see him again here. Um, we see Kuma and Doflamingo. What is Doflamingo cooking? Something has to happen soon with this guy. I know he's beloved. I know he's beloved. But outside of some interesting things about the era of Smiles, which we got, uh, I think in Thriller Bark, maybe Sabouti, don't remember exactly. But other than that stuff, there hasn't been a ton of establishment for him. Not as much as some of the other characters, so I really hope Doflamingo plays a really intriguing role in Marineford. And then after that, we see all the admirals, notably Kizaru and Akainu, who is also Sakazuki, who we know from his heinous acts in... Um, in Robin's backstory. Notably, Akainu and Kizadu are have a very similar pose. Both of them have their arms either together or crossed, and one leg, one leg over the other. However, Aokiji, the third admiral, such an interesting character. I love this guy. I want more from him really soon, but continues to be one of the most interesting characters. Sitting completely different from them. He is uh, not one leg over the other. His legs are just spread apart, and his arms are in his lap. And while Kizadu and Akainu are looking straight ahead, he's kind of tilted, looking to the side. Clearly showing he has a different energy from these two. He has different motives. He's cut from a different cloth. And what is Aokiji going to do this arc? Oh, this is so interesting. So many different characters coalescing here. It's so thrilling to me. I can't wait to see how it all plays out. Garp is here, and he's being told by Sudu to not feel bad about something. Uh, and he kind of laughs it off. We'll get to that in a second. And he also gets told by Sengoku that he has to reveal the truth. And Garp seems to be disgruntled about something. And so Sengoku begins addressing the crowd at large and Ace as well. He questions Ace here. And he says, who is your father? Ace, of course, as established in the beginning of Impel Down, says, Whitebeard. And Sengoku goes on to realize that, no, your mother, who had you in her womb for 20 months, saved you. And your father is none other than Gold D. Roger. W Holy shit, what a bombshell. And from here, we can get some stuff from Garp that makes him really, really interesting here. Um, we see why Sudu's told him it's not your fault. And he kind of laughed it off. That reminded me immediately of... Because he clearly feels bad. He feels like he might have failed um, Roger by this secret coming out. Everything that Ace represents, being Gold D. Roger's kid, being his son... What a statement it would make for the world government to execute the son of Goldie Roger. To emphasize, no, this pirate age is not there. It is not starting again. It is being cut at the root right here. Literally, the root, the seed. So what a statement it could make. They need Ace executed, and they need to make a show of it. Because him being Goldie Roger's son, what it would do for their reputation, it can't be overstated. And so that's more evidence for why Ace may die. If, we, if we're talking about long-term for the story, for the world government to continue to, you know, they need to take a W somewhere. It could happen by defeating Whitebeard. That's very, that makes them much more fearsome, defeating this living, living legend. It could also happen by them killing 
Ace, bearing the torch of his father, who is the representative of piracy. But nonetheless, Garp, you can tell, he feels bad that he was unable to keep this secret. He was unable to honor it. But it also says a lot about him that he was able to bear this secret for someone who was antagonistic towards him. Garp and Roger were on opposite sides. I would love to learn more about their dynamic and how they interacted and how they came about exactly. We see a quick flash where he says to Garp, my unborn child is innocent, take care of my son. Innocent of the sins in which he is convicting him for. So Garp did that. And you can tell he feels badly about it. And one detail I love is, like grandfather, like grandson. When Sudu says, it's not your fault to try to comfort him, he laughs it off. It reminded me immediately of how Luffy, at the beginning of Amazon Lily, when overcome with regret and grief and feelings of inadequacy and being disappointed in himself, needed to laugh. Needed to laugh to not feel the pain. To numb himself from the pain. So he took those mushrooms to laugh. In response to his pain, Luffy laughs. In response to his pain, Garp laughs. Really interesting stuff there. The implications of those, I don't think I can even begin to grasp all of them, but all the stuff I've already said, what it means for Garp, what it means for Ace, what, how this would change the agenda of the world government, and what Ace represents, there's so much there. What a bombshell. I'm so glad the mods kind of coerced me into reading this. Uh, and also, notably, chapter 550 is narrated in a very history is written by the victors sort of way. Very biased for the world government. Try, again, trying to kind of rewrite history. If you look at the commentary, there's a specific line, because the commentary, the, the narration, does chronicle the events that are happening, but the complexion and tone of it is very telling. For instance, let me try to find it. The narration here kind of says what's going on. It says, uh, the Navy's most powerful officers are here, the three admirals. Porkos D. Ace kneels and, ex and awaits his fate on the execution uh, platform. People are gathering in the square. The warlords are here. Everyone's gathering here. That's kind of what it says. But then it says something really interesting. These mighty defenders of justice have come to prevent the rescue of Ace and to do battle with Whitebeard and his pirates. The framing there. That is not a neutral commentary. That is not a neutral narration. Talking about the Navy admirals and the world government in general as mighty defenders of justice. It is being narrated by someone who has an agenda. History In a very, like I said, history is written by the victor's way. Something's going on with this narration, something's going on here, and I really want to know who is saying this, who is narrating this. We gotta find out somehow, somehow we do, because that's very intentional by Oda. That doesn't, that's not in there by accident. If it was just general manga commentary, it would have a neutral tone, but it's calling them defenders of justice, mighty defenders of justice. Something's going on there. There's so much density packed into these details, it's amazing, I love this stuff. Uh, and. And to go back, circle back to just the revelation that Roger is uh, is Ace's dad again, uh, someone in chat reminded me that there was a, di a line of dialogue between Ace and Garp at the beginning of Impel Down, where Ace says that we both had the blood of fam famous criminals running through their veins, uh, when he was talking about Luffy uh, and him. Luffy has the blood of Dragon running through his veins, whereas uh, Ace has the blood of Roger, where I might have assumed that it was both of them Dragon. Anyways... Wow, what an arc. That was Impel Down. Uh, you know, I was thinking internally about how much I was enjoying it throughout, and like I said, it's rollicking, it's a thriller, it's fun, it's non-stop, it just doesn't let up. There's great comedy, there's great character work for Buggy and Jinbei and Luffy and revelations and plot stuff and uh, world building. It's all awesome, and it's tons of fun, and yet there's so much thematics packed into these details. It's great in that way. Um, in a way that I think could easily be missed, so I love that. Lots of interesting musings on the themes of justice and perspective through Hanyabal, uh, the theme of connection, like I mentioned, the theme of miracles, that undercurrent, and what that means, and is clearly going to come to a head a lot of these things in Marineford. I just can't stop thinking about Buggy and his journey and his arc. It's awesome. And I also can't stop thinking about Ace and what's going to happen, and all these personalities congregating at... Marine Ford. It reminds me of how all these people were at Alabasta, but the scale is just way bigger somehow. And I was thrilled about that in Alabasta. So you can imagine how excited I am to read the next part. At this moment, I've only, like I said, I've only read the first chapter. Like I said, I have lots of theories. I've, I've, I'm not going to repeat them here, but Buggy and his role in the future of the story could be so interesting. Um, what the Marines represent, how that leads to Kobe, 
we talked about tons of interesting things this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, and also the theories about who could potentially die. Whitebeard Ace, like I said, I could even say see Jinbei dying. I hope if it's Jinbei or... I think, I think I hope if it's any of them, really... I hope they get a bit more establishment so they really, so Oda really digs the nail in. But I do think someone's gonna die. In before next video, I look like an absolute clown and no one dies, and I was totally wrong. Nonetheless, I hope you enjoy my ramblings, my musings. Uh, this has been one of the funnest videos I've recorded so far because Impel Down itself is so fun. Uh, this is easily in my top five arcs in the series. I'd have to think about exactly where. Let's see, there's Water 7. In order, this is my top five arcs, by the way, at the moment not including Impel Down. Water 7 in Ennie's Lobby, number one. Number two would be um, Skypia. Number three would be Sabaudi Archipelago. Number four would be uh, Alabasta. Number five, Jaya. Arlong Park just outside them. If I'm thinking about that top five, yeah, I think, I think Impel Down is at least fourth. It's at least fourth. It's a solid nine out of 10 thoroughly enjoyed it start to finish so much fun so much fun i hope you guys can see the passion i feel for this arc uh it was great and i'm so excited for marine ford now as for the character ranking there's been a little bit of a shakeup, and i think this is the first time and the last time i'm going to increase the character count for my top x rankings we now have a top 20 but to start off with the honorable mentions we have koza calgara iceberg luchi spandam mary cricket rayleigh Ace, Jinbei, Mr. Tubong Clay, and Garp. To me, Ace is substantial enough to now be an honorable mention. Same with Mr. Tubong Clay, same with Garp. I think they've all become substantial characters, and I need a bit more from them for them to become favorites. But nonetheless, I'm very glad with their trajectory, and I can't wait for more from all of them. Uh, and Jinbei, Jinbei a new addition. Love what I've seen from Jinbei so far. Hope it continues. Now, as for characters that I, uh, I'm going to let them cook... I need a bit more from Whitebeard, Law, Kid, and Doflamingo. Those are the ones that come to mind the most, but I have great hopes for all four of them, and I'm sure eventually they'll become great characters. So now to go into the top 20, um, I struggle between Hero Look and Mihawk. Either one of those could be number 20. The other one can go down to honorable mentions. Um, maybe let's say Hero Look because uh, Mihawk is present and I think could get some really cool stuff. I didn't even mention Mihawk in that I'm really excited about him and seeing, seeing what he'll do here. Oh god, Marine Ford, holy shit. But let's give it to Hero Look, because Mihawk, I think, could elevate himself through being present in Marine Ford. So, number 20, uh, Hero Look. Number 19, Blackbeard. Uh, he's become one of the most engaging hooks in the series, and I think he has enough substance. He's enough of an antagonistic force of nature while being really thematically interesting, being a foil to Luffy. There's enough substance there now for me to say pretty comfortably that, yeah, he's in my top 20. He's one of my most engaging hooks at the moment to see where he goes. He keeps me guessing. He's really interesting. Uh, Blackbeard's number 19. Number 18 is Sir Crocodile. Number 17, Shanks. Number 16, Roger. Number 15, Aokiji. This guy keeps me guessing. Want to know what's going on with him. Number 14, Chopper. Number 13, Frankie. Number 12, Smoker. Number 11, Wiper. Number 10, Noland. I switched those around. Uh, Noland ahead of Wiper. Number 9, Buggy. Big jump from not even in honorable mentions to number 9. And that may seem drastic. There may be recency bias. I don't really care. He's my ninth favorite One Piece character at the moment. He's so interesting. He's so fun. His character progression is unlike anyone else in the series. And honestly, I wanted to put him a little higher than this. Brooke is number 8. Sanji number 7. Vivi number 6. By the way, we saw a cover with Vivi cooking. It was beautiful to see her again. Number 5, Nami. Number 4, Zoro. Number 3, Robin. And again... It's very hard for me to decide between Luffy and Usopp for number one. That's my order. Uh, bit of a shakeup, but I'm I'm loving it. I'm loving the direction of the story. I'm really enjoying this. Uh, hopefully you guys can tell. Thank you for sticking with me for this whole long video. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you for all the patrons, all the support. And as always, if you want to see the next video where I will be reviewing Marine Ford you can do so right now by becoming a patron, uh, getting early access on Patreon. If you'd like to watch me react and read through every single chapter live on Twitch, you can follow me using the link in the description and pinned comment. And lastly, 
please join my Discord if you're interested in stream schedule stuff, uh, g general chilling, hanging out with other people, like-minded One Piece fans, or even if you're not a One Piece fan, I don't know why you'd be watching this, but even if you're not, um, there are tons of other subjects on there. It's definitely multi-dimensional. So you can join the Discord if you'd like. Just a reminder one more time, one last time, if you want your comment to be highlighted in a future video, just use the hashtag AJP somewhere in your comment. Uh, that aside, thank you so much for your time. Ah, uh, God, this is so much fun to record. See you in the next one, where uh, maybe I'll have experienced a death. Hopefully I'll have experienced peak fiction. See you guys in the next one, and many thanks for watching once again.